Welcome everyone to the WrestlePod. Subscribe now for more pro wrestling and pop culture content. Please welcome the man known as the ultimate warrior. Be a warrior in your life. Don't be one of the millions. Be one in a million. Don't just be a leader. Be a leader for the leaders. But we're going to do squats this way. You put the bar on the back and you squat fucking down. Feet flat. Like you're shitting over a hole. From the very first thrash of a guitar string and the smash of the cymbal, for that classic 80s drum beat, an enormously muscled man screeches around the corner and reveals his neon face paint and wild bush of hairspray, his arms flailing wildly in every direction as he manically screams into the baying crowd. Everything about the Ultimate Warrior was electric. One of the most recognisable faces of the WWF in the 1980s and 90s, the face paint and intensity leading to a huge explosion in popularity on his way to world title glory, leaving a legacy of dedication, hard work and perseverance. However, in order to achieve such elevated levels of success within the pro wrestling business, the man under all of that hair and spandex had to give up a little of himself, something which in his later years saw Jim Helwig becoming one of the most controversial members of the wrestling community. Helwig and those who were close to the man have spoken about how the lines between Jim, the real-life person, and the Ultimate Warrior became more and more blurred with every ounce of success afforded to him. Helwig believed in becoming his character inside the wrestling ropes and out, something which he continued to strongly base his life around up until his untimely demise. The man was passionate and erratic in equal measure, and for that he has become, if nothing else, one of the most interesting and unusual stories in all of pro wrestling history. Here is just a taste of what it sounds like inside of this madman's head, and just because it is so insane, I need to assure you that this is a real quote. Jumping up on the apron, skirting back and forth on the first apron that I jump up on, turning around, running to the ring post, going around the outside of the ring post, shuffling backwards down a second ring rope, doing a complete 360 with my body, grabbing the ropes, leaning back, shaking the ropes, running in the ring, crawling through the ropes, running in the ring, back and forth, hitting the ropes, running up into the corners, standing on the second rope, facing the crowd, raising my arms up over my head. That would be the Ultimate Warrior ring entrance. When you hear that aloud, it sounds almost incomprehensible, but when you see the Ultimate Warrior in action, somehow it all makes sense. Well, sort of. In this video, I'll explore Jim Helwig's tough upbringing and dark past through his meteoric rise to fame and eventually his downfall. We'll uncover the truth behind a man who was both loved and hated for his views on gender and race and find out exactly what led the Ultimate Warrior into becoming so divisive. I just... You gotta love the wrestling business, especially the pundits. It's just the Kool-Aid never runs out. Jim Helwig was born in Crawfordsville, Indiana, United States, as the oldest amongst five children. His childhood was marked by the challenges that came with growing up in a large family, but he remained determined and focused on his goals. At the age of 11, he began training with weights, I was into bodybuilding. I was competing in bodybuilding. I was really a muscle head. I had a group of friends in chiropractic school, and we all spent more time in the gym than we did at school. As he grew older, the young man's passion for weightlifting continued to flourish. Helwig spent countless hours in the gym, pushing himself to become stronger and more fit. He began competing in local competitions and quickly gained a reputation as a talented athlete. His dedications paid off when he won his first major competition at the age of just 18, cementing his status as a rising star in the world of bodybuilding. He became good friends with an old rusty universal weight machine. Nothing fancy, it was old school. He started lifting and enjoyed seeing the benefits it had on his body, both in strength 
looks and the discipline it gave him to push himself and his body to the limit, physically and mentally. Despite this early success, the young man remained humble. Helwig continued to train rigorously, pushing himself to new heights of strength and endurance, slowly growing into the monster of a physique that wrestling fans would eventually know in The Ultimate Warrior. I set an educational goal for myself to become a chiropractor. I turned my hobby of working out into a successful bodybuilding career. At the tail end of my schooling, the school being in Atlanta and it being a hotbed for pro wrestling, my bodybuilding success created an opportunity to get into the business of wrestling. I took up weight training and bodybuilding and from that I was bold enough to think after I saw the changes in my scrawny little body that I could make changes in my life in other ways. However, Helwig's initial career path saw his future as a chiropractor, with Helwig enrolling in medical school to earn a diploma. He said, I planned to become a chiropractor. I didn't follow wrestling at all. I thought I could make some money, come back to the chiropractic later. I decided to go for it. As Helwig focused on building up his physique, he continued to garner the attention of those in influential positions in the bodybuilding industry, signing a sponsorship with the original Gold's Gym, a hotbed for pro wrestlers at the time. In 1984, I won the Mr. Georgia competition. From that, I went to the Mr. America competition that year in New Orleans. However, other wrestlers and performers from within the industry have since gone on to say that they had an issue with the fact that he was all body and no skill. He wasn't raised as a wrestler. He wasn't in the business because he loved wrestling. He was a guy who used to work out, and he thought that this was easy money. He had a great body and his hair was long. It all stopped there. Once the bell rang, it was all over. I lived in Atlanta at the time. That's where the chiropractic school was. And Atlanta was a hotbed for professional wrestling. I knew all the wrestlers. I didn't know them personally, but I knew of them because I'd seen them in and out of the different gyms I went to to work out. Turned out within a couple of weeks, I didn't have the money to float the beginning phases of becoming a wrestler, and the bottom fell out. We lost our place to live, had just enough to eat peanut butter and make midnight snack runs at local grocery stores, eating in the aisles. Steve, glad to have you guys here. This One of the fellow performers who had begun their wrestling journey at the same time was Steve Borden, who would go on to don black and white face paint of his own as Sting. Both Borden and Helwig became a part of a wrestling group known as Power Team USA, attempting to train in the finer arts of grappling and spandex, whilst contacting show promoters in order to receive a tryout. To top it off, as Steve and I later found out, this guy training us didn't know jack about how the business operated on the inside. Even if he'd had the money to feed us and get us fully trained, his big plan still would have failed. Steve and I stayed positive about it all, and really, our ignorance about things was a blessing. Helwig and Borden continued to train together and eventually debuted in the Continental Wrestling Association as the Blade Runners. We did everything together, laundry, gym, groceries, always together. We had one car, I'd sold mine so we could eat in California. We drove to the towns together, sometimes four or five hours one way, and with four or five guys in the car to cover the cost of gas. We slept in a flea bag hotel until we got an apartment, then we slept on the floor, ate tuna fish out of the can. It was rough, but we stayed positive as we could. I thought a lot about going back to school, but didn't even have the money to get back to Georgia, let alone re-enroll. Sheer determination and hard work could only take these young upstart talents so far, however. Although both men possessed standout physiques, that was where their talents in the wrestling ring ended. Several other performers at the time coming out since and stating just how terrible Helwig and Borden were when they first started. We had a tag team come through that literally had their first couple of matches with us here in Memphis and I went back and I told Jerry Jarrett, I said, oh my gosh, these guys are so green. I mean, they've got good bodies and everything, but they could barely walk around in the ring, much less have a match with somebody. And of course, it turned out to be Sting and the Ultimate Warrior. But when they came to us, as I think the Blade Runners or something like that, they were awful. But just because they were so green, they were just getting started. The two men would later join the Universal Wrestling Federation before eventually disbanding in 1986, starting their own separate journeys to becoming some of the most beloved performers of their generation. 
it was it was just a business th thing, really. You know, I was doing Ed a favor and and uh, set Jim up with with workouts and tanning, and you know, took care of him. And he had carte blanche, and he just came and went as he wanted. And but you know, Southern California. I mean, this is where the Neanderthals are. You know, and we knew there was nothing we could do about it. It was all about paying dues. We sent pictures out to everybody on a list of wrestling organizations that we had. We only had 10 to 15 hours of training and that was lifting each other over our heads and dropping one another on the floor on the basic gymnastic mats. And they came straight from that school to Memphis mm. and they were, I mean, they should have still been buying a ticket actually. Back then, the world of pro wrestling was dominated behind the scenes by old-fashioned men with enormous egos, whose size was only matched by its fragility. Being new in the business was tough due to the hard working conditions, long hours, low pay, and the toll that wrestling took on your body. But even then, other, longer established stars would not make your first steps in the ring easy ones. We came into Mid-South, and Bill Watts had this reputation for roughing up new guys, especially muscle guys that wanted to make it in the business and showed deference to him because he was the boss. I'd heard the stories through the grapevine about what he did. He wanted me to get down on all fours like a dog, and he was going to show me how to throw a working kick to the underbelly, or so he makes you think. Well, I heard about what he did. He would kick the shit out of you and bust your ribs. It was like a test to see if you would take their crap. And I knew what he was going to do, and I said, look, if you want me on all fours, you're going to have to put me there yourself. Of course, he wasn't man enough to go for that. He wanted me at a disadvantage to begin with. This is something that the whole locker room didn't expect, because guys come into the business and they really want to make it, and they do whatever it takes. I picked up the phone and called WCCW over in Texas, and that's when I went over there and started the Dingo Warrior. And I think that he felt self-conscious that he wasn't as polished as he should have been, they put him in a situation he wasn't ready for. An incident that has been reported around this time involves Jim Helwig harassing a female fan at an event in the late 1980s. According to the fan's account, Helwig approached her and made sexually suggestive comments, including asking her if she wanted to feel the power of his muscles. The fan reported the incident to the wrestling company's management, but it is unclear if any action was taken against the warrior at this time. Another incident occurred later in the 1992 interview with talk show host Arsenio Hall, where the Ultimate Warrior made sexually suggestive comments about Miss Elizabeth, who was at the time the real-life girlfriend of wrestler Randy Savage. He stated he wanted to put his big arms around her and show her the true meaning of the word ultimate. This incident caused considerable backlash and criticism from fans and fellow wrestlers, with many calling out Jim Helwig for his inappropriate behaviour. There are also reports that Helwig made inappropriate comments to female wrestlers and other women in the industry. Former WWE wrestler Candice Michelle has stated that the Ultimate Warrior made inappropriate comments to her during their first time working together. In a 2014 interview with Wrestle Inc., she stated that the Ultimate Warrior made comments that were sexual in nature and that she found uncomfortable. Another incident involves the Ultimate Warrior making inappropriate comments to female wrestler Jacqueline Moore. In a 2007 interview with Wrestling Observer Radio, Moore stated that the Ultimate Warrior had made comments to her about her body and appearance and that she found his behaviour to be inappropriate. It is worth noting that the wrestling industry has historically been male-dominated and has had a reputation for being hostile towards women. However, the Ultimate Warrior's behaviour towards women was particularly egregious and reflected a culture of toxic masculinity that was pervasive in the industry at the time. Around this time, Jim Helwig met a woman by the name of Shari Lynn Tyree. The couple's serendipitous encounter took place in the bustling city of Dallas, Texas, at none other than the locally renowned Million Dollar Saloon Strip Club. It was at this seedy establishment that Shari, an ambitious woman with a fierce determination to make a name for herself, was working as an exotic dancer. The pair were married in October of 1982. So many of the stories of Helwig's personal life comes from Miss Tyree. 
a woman who shared almost nine years watching her husband change from a man into a monster at home. The couple's initial meeting at the Million Dollar Saloon was just the beginning of a long and eventful journey that would see them both face triumphs and challenges. I will be referring to Shari for first-hand evidence when looking into the mental state of Helwig, as well as quoting from her subsequent autobiographies and tell-all journals in an attempt to better flesh out the story. A fierce lion, a polar bear, a bald eagle, a great white shark. All of these animals are feared and respected apex predators, dominant over their environment and masters over the landscape. A dingo is a small cute dog, which was first described in 1789 by Watkin Tench in his narrative of expedition to Botany Bay in Australia. The only domestic animal they have is the dog, which in their language is called dingo and a good deal resembles the fox of England. These animals are equally shy of us and attached to the natives. So when Jim Helwig first made his way to WCCW in 1986, you can see why he would want such an animal to represent his character. Or perhaps not. So when I went to Texas, I started the Dingo Warrior character, and that really started from being on the rodeo grounds there at Fort Worth Coliseum, and the crew had all come in, and the locker room all started talking about what I should be, and somebody said that I looked like a warrior. We threw the word Dingo in front of it, and I was the Dingo Warrior. The Dingo Warrior joined forces with Lance Von Eric, the pair forming a tag team and winning the WCWA titles in November of 1986. Shortly after losing the belts, the pair disbanded and Helwig had his first taste of independent success. On February 2nd, 1987, the Dingo Warrior beat Bob Bradley for the WCWA Texas Heavyweight Championship. He didn't like the locker room, he didn't like the business. He liked to have roid rages at diners. I was there, I'm calling it like it is. I've seen him hurt people. My biggest memory, and I'll never forget this, is... It was somewhere in Indiana. Brian Costello, he worked for Vince, and that stupid warrior clotheslined him in the face. It knocked him out. Brian came back and collapsed. Tony Guerrero was like, are you alright, are you alright? And I felt bad. And Warrior walked by and looked at him and shook his head, then kept on walking like, you piece of crap. And he was stiff in the ring, but I knew how to work around that. That didn't bother me. I don't give a crap. I didn't like his attitude. I didn't like him. Helwig held on to the belt until the summer of 1987, his continued growth in both his ability between the ropes and the size of his bulging muscles had caught the eye of Vincent McMahon and the WWF, who offered him a contract in June. However, Helwig's skills and muscles weren't the only things that had grown. As wrestling fans around the world would soon find out, the biggest thing the Dingo Warrior had grown was his ego. The Ultimate Warrior, I was a fan of the guy. You know, I liked what he did to our industry. He raised the pay scale. You know, he set box office records and he was well compensated for it and allowed other guys to come along and make a good living. Jim Helwig signed the contract with Titan Sports, the holding company for WWF at the time, in June of 1987. Due to his limited skills on the mic and the fact that Helwig had seemingly only learnt the very basics of in-ring combat, WWF offered a trainee-like contract with a view to improve their offer when their new signee had shown his own signs of improvement. Helwig signed for two years initially, being paid by appearance with no base for his take-home. He was, however, paid a portion of merchandise sales and a piece of the revenue for each ticket sold at the shows he participated in. So they brought me in for about eight or nine months and kept me down with the sea talent, just testing me, seeing if I was going to listen, seeing if I had what it takes to travel, see where my head was at if I was halfway together. Although Helwig had initially maintained his Dingo Warrior character, that was all soon to change. Then came the time when they were going to put me on TV, and they sold me that they liked the warrior, but they didn't like Dingo. But for the entire time I was behind the scenes, they told me that they weren't going to use the warrior thing, because that's what they did back then. They didn't use people's identities that they brought in, they created their own. But since my character was getting over so well, they decided to go with the warrior thing. Alongside the new ultimate name, 
every other aspect of Hellwig's wrestling character had to level up. Around this time, Warrior was given the iconic slamming guitar entrance theme, which paired perfectly with his new frantic ultimate entrance. So now you have the unforgettable look, the heart-thumping sprint to the ring, the manic pulling of the ropes, all perfectly elevated by the classic 80s soundtrack. Warrior is frothing at the mouth, his eyes bulging out of his head as he is chomping at the bit to get the match started. He heaves his enormous body towards his opponent, smashing them with his forearm. As they crash to the mat, the ultimate warrior begins charging around the ring, stomping up and down, beating his chest and screaming like a lunatic. It's so hard not to get caught up in this kind of enthusiasm and energy, it truly is captivating even now. But then, it happens. The ultimate finisher. The warrior lifts his opponent high above his head, making it look ridiculously effortless. An impressive feat which is instantly deflated as the opponent is dropped half-heartedly to the canvas as the warrior bounces off the ropes a few times, before eventually stopping, hopping in the air and landing from the death-defying distance of about three feet onto his enemy's back. To me, this must be one of the greatest disparities between the way in which a pro wrestler is portrayed through their entrance and persona as compared to their moveset and grand finisher. The Gorilla Press is, for sure, an amazing display of strength and technique, a great callback to Warrior's roots in bodybuilding, but the subsequent fall and splash are lacking in both technical marvel and believability. Sure, having a massive bloke drop me on my face in a wrestling ring and then flop onto me would probably kill me. Even for these well-trained athletes, it probably still doesn't feel very pleasant. But is it really enough to win a match? Especially against the likes of Macho Man Randy Savage, Andre the Giant, or even the immortal Hulk Hogan? I'm not so sure. My response is, look, you guys were in the business for a dozen years before I even got there. A dozen years and you never figured it out that wrestling skills per se were not where it was at. It was about being a gimmick. I got there and in two years I figured it out. It wasn't part of my gimmick. It wouldn't fit Ultimate Warrior to keep doing the wrestling stuff. I was smart enough to know that. Making that decision is up to the talent. In other words, whatever a wrestler decides to portray himself as in the ring, character-wise, he's the one that develops that. It has been said by many who wrestled against Hellwig's different in-ring personas that he never achieved great technical mastery within a wrestling ring. Some even complained about feeling unsafe working matches with him which was causing other wrestlers to air their grievances with Hellwig in the locker room. He just wasn't an athletic kind of guy to me. He looked like he was clumsy all the time and he wouldn't listen. You'd tell him not to clothesline because I've got a bad neck. I jumped up on the apron. I told him to come from behind me and run me into the post. So he runs from behind and clotheslines me. Perhaps the reason that Ultimate Warriors matches contained a handful of kicks and punches a slam or two and a lot of running around, was in part to protect those who he faced. Perhaps the gorilla press and running splash served as a way of making sure the warrior had simple moves he could pull off consistently at the end of his bouts. We wrestled twice, maybe three times. Why? We just didn't have any chemistry. We are in Winnipeg, Canada and I wrestled the warrior. We came back and Pat Patterson said, I have to tell you that that's the worst championship match I have ever seen. I said, Pat, you don't have to tell me. I was in it, because he sent me over a three-page letter to memorise, and I don't do that. All of this was to say that I don't think having a limited moveset and quick, somewhat repetitive matches is necessarily a bad thing. In fact, in the case of the Warrior, I think it worked to put over the idea that this maniac would run from the back and defeat you in a matter of moments. So the whole roster should be afraid. And I do like that idea. I just wish he would have put a bit more emphasis at the end of his matches. One punctuating slam or powerbomb or something. Anything other than this drop and flop. This dash and crash of nothingness. Warrior couldn't have a long match. He didn't have the cardio for it. It would have been unsafe for anybody that was booked against Warrior to have him in a long match. Because fatigue creates mistakes. You boys a bit bored? Snap me to it! Snap me to a slim jam! Tear to the spice! Make me just a taste! Hey, nice! And tea! Snap me to it! Need a little excitement! 
Snap into a Slim Jim! It became the fastest ever intercontinental title match in WWE history when, in August of 1988, Ultimate Warrior replaced the injured Brutus the Barber Beefcake in a match scheduled to take place at the first ever SummerSlam. In under 30 seconds, the Warrior made his way to the ring and pinned the Honky Tonk Man to win his first WWE title. And in an unexpected moment of delirium, Jim Helwig had his first taste of success on a big stage. Honky knew I was getting the belt. Honky also knew that once he dropped the belt to me, we were going to get another four, five month run around the territory with him chasing the belt. So what it meant for both of us, main event, semi-mains, whatever, good money, real good money. And by changing it at the last second because Warrior, whatever, threw a tantrum and said he was going to quit if he didn't get the belt, Honky was so mad, that's why he dropped the belt in 10 seconds. Nevertheless, this crowning moment proved to be pivotal in Warrior's career as he retained it until the following WrestleMania, where he lost the belt during his legendary feud with Ravishing Rick Rude, the pair continuing in heated matches throughout the year until Warrior regained his intercontinental title to become a two-time champion at SummerSlam in 1989. Helwig has since gone on to say that his hard work was to thank for this successful period. I'd also busted my ass in painful ways they never had, years of training in the gym, self-discipline in working out and dieting. If they want to criticise anybody, they should criticise the promoters who were, in effect, telling them, your little bag of fancy wrestling moves don't sell tickets, t-shirts, posters, dolls, etc. So I leave them and your tears at home. Instead, show up with some muscles and some energy. What am I supposed to apologise? I did what it took at that time and they didn't. I got to see exactly what kind of champion warrior was during a show in Omaha. Propped up on a stretcher a few feet outside of the dressing room was a Make-A-Wish kid who had looked to be down to his last few hours. There was not a hair left on his head and not even his warrior face paint could mask his sad eyes. Sickly pale and barely breathing through a ventilator tube, the boy wore a purple warrior t-shirt and green and orange tassel tied around his biceps to honour his hero. His mother and father and an older brother and sister were with him, patiently waiting for the promised encounter with the ultimate warrior. I bent over to say hello, as did all the other wrestlers on the way into the dressing room. It was odd, but there was warrior actually sitting with us. He usually kept to himself in his private dressing room. By the time the third match started, a WWF public relations rep poked his head in and politely asked Warrior if he was ready to meet the dying boy. Warrior grunted, In a minute, I'm busy. I thought to myself, busy doing what? Talking to a bunch of guys you can't stand anyway. As the night wore on, the family waited just outside the dressing room door, the boy hanging on to his dying wish to meet his hero. As I was returning to the dressing room after my match, I was relieved to see that they weren't there anymore. I assumed that kid's wish had come true. Warrior's entrance music played while Jim and I quickly showered in hopes of beating the crowd out of the building. We'd have to hurry since Warrior never went over 10 minutes. We dressed, grabbed our bags and took off. As we rounded a corner down a backstage ramp, we came upon the boy and his weary family, who had been moved there so as not to get in the way of Warrior's entrance. I thought, that lousy piece of shit. He'd made them wait all night, unable to summon the compassion to see this real little warrior. Hogan, Randy and countless others, including Andre, never hesitated to take the time to meet a sick dying kid. But not a little respect do I have for the ultimate warrior. To me, he was a coward, a weakling, a phony hero. My disgust for warrior magnified a thousand times. It broke my heart. Um, WrestleMania 6, would you say it was the biggest night of your career? Yeah. At WrestleMania 6, later that year, with Hogan still the WWF champion and Royal Rumble winner, he moved on from his feud with Mr. Perfect and set his sights on the crazed Ultimate Warrior and his intercontinental belt. A passing of the torch moment between the aging Hogan and his perceived successor, the Ultimate Warrior, who had grown to receive some of the biggest reactions in the company over the last year. An iconic title for title match which saw the new face of pro wrestling take on its greatest champion, New Blood vs. The Established Order. 
a changing of the guard and a special moment in pro wrestling history. Both Hogan and Warrior were wrestlers whose popularity arose from their charisma, energy and personality outside of the ring rather than their actions within it. Thus, the match in the main event of WrestleMania 6 was not a technical masterpiece of high-flying action and expert grappling. However, it is undeniable that when these two men came face to face, there was an electricity in the Toronto Dome that night, and the fans around the world could barely contain their excitement. When Ultimate Warrior eventually won, Hogan decided to personally hand over the title to him, a practice not commonly seen inside the ropes. Never missing an opportunity to grandstand and pose, yet again Hogan stole the limelight and very much overstayed his welcome. Making the ending of the event more about his loss than the Ultimate Warrior's victory. In recent years, Hogan has gone on to say that the finish of the match and his passing of the torch was not his idea and he would have liked to have handled the situation very differently. He said, WrestleMania 6 when he asked me to put the warrior over and I said that's no problem at all brother and my question always is if I'm putting somebody over what are we doing after that? There wasn't really a clear cut answer for that. I said how about this? When I put him over I hand him the belt and everybody's cheering for him. I get halfway down the aisle and how about I just turn around and just drop him and drag him around the ring and just crucify him? In my opinion, this shows that Hogan truly did only want the spotlight for himself and even back then had suggested ideas which would only work to further his position at the end of WrestleMania 6 and further undermine the Ultimate Warrior's victory. Back at the beginning of my career, I had to make all these sacrifices sleeping in a car on nights where I'd wrestle in front of 20,000 people because I wasn't making any money. Then, for two years leading up to WrestleMania, I would hear all the background chatter of how popular the character was becoming. Merchandising and licensing are huge in our business, and back then they actually had a guy, Jimmy, who would set up a table and sell merch before the matches. One day, Jimmy took me aside and told me how I was selling more merchandise than Hogan. This is when the true Ultimate Warrior was born. All of Jim Helwig's ambition, drive and patience had fully merged with the face paint, energy and will to win of his wrestling counterpart. The pair had become intertwined in a way which saw wrestling storylines becoming real in his mind. After the match, he kind of went off on his own a little bit just to take it all in and just to give himself a big pat on the back and say, wow, nobody believes in me, but I did it. He was rich and now he was the world champion, but that was short-lived. Literally two months after, Jim Helwig left and Ultimate Warrior came home. He became really erratic, he started staying on the road, which he never did before. He was disconnected, something was off. This melding of the two men was seen as purposeful and greatly rewarding by Helwig. The more you gave to your character, the more you actually became this character in all different ways. In your interviews, in your ring actions, the way you carried yourself outside of the ring, it really meant something. But it also meant that the animosity he felt for his fellow wrestlers, and especially those competing for a position atop WWF's card, as real-life enemies, and especially, especially, Hulk Hogan. Over the years, Hogan and Warrior would go on to clash a handful of times in the ring, each one less magical than the previous, never managing to capture the electricity of that title-for-title title match at WrestleMania. However, outside of the ring, the real-world feud only grew hotter as the years went by. Was there some tension between you guys and Beef Man? Not on my end. What was his issue with you? When we were uh, wrestling, he was cool. Yeah. With Warrior seemingly jealous of not only the money that his rival was making, but also the celebrity and fame that was afforded to Hulk Hogan over him. In the latter part of his life, Warrior began recording and releasing his own YouTube vlog series, where he discussed his controversial ideas on pro wrestling and the wider world. Hulk Hogan, or rather Terry Bollea, would it be okay if we used his legal name? airing his grievances publicly with performers from his past. 
and a huge portion of these videos, as you would guess, would eventually get around to the topic of Hulk Hogan. As these videos continue to be released, Hellwig began to grow more angry and, and more steadfast in his more radical ideas on how Hogan had treated him and how their relationship had fared. Beyond that, Hellwig continually threw accusations at Hogan of being a liar and a poor father and husband, threatening to expose his mortal enemy as the fraud that the warrior believed he was. This led to Hogan making similar accusations about Warrior and the pair's families begun being involved in the insults. It wouldn't be until years later that the two men would seemingly reconcile their differences and make amends for the years of pointless abuse and fighting. A few times he flew back to my house and uh, hung out at the pool with my kids. He was great with my kids. Did anybody talk to the Ultimate Warrior? Look at him in the face paint and shake his hand, brother, so I got nothing but love for you. Well, what was his issue with you? I don't know. I don't know. I went right up to him. I shook his hand and said, brother, I know I'm not supposed to talk to you, but I just want to let you know that I love you. And if you ever want to be friends, I'd love to be friends with you. If we could ever do business, that would be great. But I just want to tell you that I love you so much. And whatever I did, please forgive me. And then I noticed that there was a WWE camera that peeled around the side. I had no idea that it had a camera following me. So that was real, bro. And I'm so glad I got to talk to him. But of course, the story isn't that simple. Whenever Terry Blair is involved, there's always going to be a grey area for what is true and what is a lie, made up to further his own public perception. It's been really quiet since the passing of my husband and the father of my girls, Mrs. Dana Warrior said in a statement. Someone sent me what Mr. Blair had to say in a video interview with Grantland, and I would just like to ask him to stop. He's the only person in the WWE universe who did not give a call or send a card. My girls asked why he didn't check on us like everyone else, and I explained simply that there isn't a camera at our mailbox or in the house when we receive our calls. I would ask respectfully, Mr. Blair, for you to understand my girls hurt, and just let some time pass before you say anything more. Perhaps these two old men were made for one another, mortal enemies from the first time they locked up in the ring until the day that one of them eventually died. Pretty sad. Uh, the McMahons over time revealed themselves in ways that I, you know, that really wasn't very cool and at the end it was really unethical. Warrior was the toughest one without a doubt quick and easy answer. I can think of guys in my head. I can see pictures now of guys in my head. Well, it might have been a bad day or this, you know, whatever. But overall, you know that any time the warrior was going to be in the building, be prepared for anything negative because generally that's what you got. In 1991, ahead of WrestleMania 7, Ultimate Warrior had decided that he was worth as much, if not more, as Hulk Hogan to WWF and demanded to renegotiate his contract ahead of the upcoming show, with a focus on a large payday for his performance at WrestleMania in line with his bitter rival. On top of that, he declared that he believed he should be paid for his travel, a larger portion of merchandise sales and a guarantee that he could get a certain number of appearances per year. It can't be smooth. It can't be professional. There's gonna be something. Something has got to change to make Warrior happy. They could have shared those philosophical thoughts, Vince and Warrior, many times prior to that Sunday. And then boom, the Warrior gets you by the short hairs. Warrior stated that if Vince McMahon did not agree to his terms, then he would not appear at the advertised WrestleMania 7. Ultimate Warrior basically came to me and figuratively held a gun to my head and said, hey, I'm not going to perform unless you pay me X number of dollars. My responsibility is to present what I have advertised. My responsibility is to the audience. So I reluctantly agreed to Warrior's demand, knowing what I was going to do as soon as he came out of the ring. However, this attempt to hold his boss ransom backfired for the Warrior, with Vince serving him his papers of unemployment soon after. It gave me great pleasure to fire him and to let him know why I was doing it. In the years since, the documents sent between Warrior and McMahon have been released, showing just how much satisfaction the company took in enacting their revenge. Your principal complaint, apparently, is that you are not being compensated at the same rate as Hulk Hogan, although Hulk is a living legend, is still much better known to the public 
has wrestled longer, is the WWF champion, is in much greater demand and a bigger draw at WWF events, is more dependable and is far more revered and respected by WWF fans and by the public at large. You have become a legend in your own mind. You are certainly not entitled to vent your feelings by breaching and threatening to breach your contract. I did use steroids, but I've been open about it from the very beginning. I don't have to go back in time and, and cover something up or a lie that I told before. I've been open and I've been candid about it. But there's a difference between use and abuse. And different than the other crybaby former talent from professional wrestling or other professional sports, uh, I don't have any whining and complaining to do. Like many professional wrestlers of his time, the Ultimate Warrior was rumoured to have used steroids to enhance his performance and physique. In 1991, he was named in a federal investigation into steroid use in professional wrestling known as the Steroid Trial. The investigation found that several wrestlers, including the Ultimate Warrior, had purchased steroids from a physician named George Zahorian. You got other professional athletes out there lying and not telling you the truth. I don't know you from anybody, and I just took the time to tell you the story about my own story about steroids. So you write that story right, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very Good. much. Good. You're welcome. All you should do is come out and tell them the truth. Quit lying to them. Tell them the truth, and be man enough to tell them the truth. You know, and say, hey, I did steroids, and, you know, I've done them for years and years and Another, who, before his death, was outspoken about steroid use in pro wrestling and his involvement was the ultimate warrior, Jim Helwig. If I had to relate anything to the lifestyle, it would be to point out how the demands of pro wrestling differ from the lifestyle of any other organised sports pro athletes. There is no season, you go year round, and with the travel you do, you can fall into a bad habit of burning the candles at both ends. It's easy to fall into a habit of abusing stimulants and painkillers to cover up for lacklustre energy. Bottom line is, there are differences between use and abuse, and it's obvious that many guys cross the line. As the Ultimate Warrior seemingly struggled to balance his unrealistic expectations of his body, his public perception, and the pressure from WWE, fractures began to appear between Jim Helwig and the pro wrestling behemoth. Vince McMahon, since Helwig's passing, commented, Warrior's experiments with growth hormones were the reason, but the steroids use was another big factor for the Ultimate Warrior's death. In 1991, Helwig's relationship with WWE was further tarnished when Vincent McMahon was charged with routinely obtaining anabolic steroids by the US Attorney in New York. The pro wrestler's use of performance enhancers was put under a very public spotlight for the first time as witnesses from the wrestling world were called to stand to testify. Oh my brother, testify! I don't think it would be a surprise to know he took steroids for a long time. I don't know if he ever stopped using them. It has also been reported that Jim Helwig was accused of leaving a stash of steroids in a Marriott hotel in Maryland in February of 1991. Many other wrestlers have since spoken about the Warriors' use of steroids and performance-enhancing drugs. And did you ever use them? Yes. Well, I weighed 295 pounds before I ever touched them. That's the story about steroids. And you better get that story right. <laughs> never ask anybody for advice. Never ask for help. Never ask for any guidance. You have a compass inside of you that's already set to guide you where you need to go. At this point, the man Jim Helwig no longer existed. All there was became the warrior, and with it a commandment from high above a set of rules which any true warrior should live by, commandments which came to be known as the trusticity. The comic book is, is, is more important to me. I, uh, one of the disciplines of living your life in the way of a warrior, and I call it destrucity. It's about making a truce between your destiny and your reality. All right, warrior, tell me about the comic book. The art or writing? Put simply, destrusticity, trifold in its definition, therefore meaning, one, the name of the galaxy and warrior wherein the terrain of testament lies. Two, the living of one's life in the way of a warrior according to a warrior's eight disciplines. Those are as follows. Physical, beliefs, moment of mastery, attitude, commitment, association, integrity, wisdom. 
the creating of a truce between one's destiny and one's reality, promising to stay true to what one is destined to be, yet accepting what is the now one's reality. No, I don't have a clue what most of that means either, and it makes me laugh a little, but if we look deeper, these seem to go further than simply explain how Warrior lives his life, or how he feels others should, and begins to verge on the slightly obsessive. It is also an insight into how Warrior views his role in wrestling, as well as how he meshed into real life. The reason why I think there's such a nostalgia for those characters back then, not just the Ultimate Warrior, was that guys themselves were charged with developing their world, their wrestling comic book world. In comic books, every character exists in this comic book world, and the wrestlers were the same thing. They were responsible for creating that world and putting it out there, having the confidence to go forward and do that and behave in a certain way. With these ideals came the production of the Ultimate Warrior graphic novel, written and produced alongside a handful of talented artists. James Callahan does the artwork on it, man, and like I said, we've been working, we worked on number one for eight months, and one of the reasons was, was finding an artist that grasped it, because a comic book can be told without even words. <laughs> a good comic book artist can tell a story just with the pictures. A vehicle of these ideas to be shown to a young audience through the medium of superhero violence and over-the-top storylines, a further blurring of the real man and the character behind it all. Yeah, you know, the attraction to the Ultimate Warrior thing is, is, is and always has been, is his level of intensity. The Ultimate Warrior character is the guy, somebody has already crossed his line, he explodes. But to come back after three years, I was going to come back and make an impression. The Ultimate Warrior would eventually return in March of 1996 at WrestleMania. The feeling of his remarkable victory over Honky Tonk Man for the Intercontinental title all those years ago, attempting to be evoked, but sadly falling short once again. This time Warrior was the older veteran, returning to squash an up-and-coming star in Hunterhurst Helmsley. The match ended with Warrior receiving the pedigree finisher and standing up immediately to finish the short bout in his old familiar fashion. I'm pretty sure I was doing Gorilla that night. Yes, I was not happy about it. Vince watched it on air live. He wasn't really happy with it. I was just pissed off about it. I felt that it was abusing the fact that Vince wasn't there backstage. It wasn't good. I didn't think that it did really much for Warrior. If Warrior just beats a piece of shit, then he just beat a piece of shit. If he beat a guy that, you know, was out there and gave him some kind of challenge, then it would have been a bigger win. So, for me, I was just not happy. I knew it beforehand, and I was not happy with it when they went to the ring, and I was even less happy when they came back. So I didn't like it. I hated it. And not everyone else was happy about it either, the match originally being planned to showcase both wrestlers before the script was changed by Warrior. We thought if anybody could lead Warrior to a big match and give him a big win, Triple H was it. It was never meant to be a short match that it became. Warrior changed it that day. I think Gerald Briscoe was the agent and Warrior was like, nah, this is the match we're going to do. Went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And at that point, it gets the match in the ring. And I looked right at Hunter and I said, if you ever have anything that you need to discuss with me, you need to come to discuss it with me face to face, man to man. Right. We're done. I'm working here. There's two matches left. I'm working here, making an apology for something I didn't do. This guy's really whatever I should. It's whatever I. It's supposed to have said to the guy. I wish I had said to the guy. It was at this time that the Warriors' demeanor backstage was said to be at his most confrontational and unpleasant. Warrior was alleged to have rudely snubbed a boy who asked for an autograph. The child turned out to be the son of the general manager of a TV station with whom the WWF did business. Vince McMahon explained the circumstances in quotes from a 1999 deposition. The general manager picked up the phone and called WWF syndication salesman Joe Perkins and said goodbye. Perkins tried to talk, tried to calm the general manager down, who had been embarrassed in front of his son. And Mr. Helwig agreed to, at the very least, do a videotaped I'm sorry, which he objected to, obviously. It wasn't uncommon, you know, for Mr. Helwig from time to time to refuse autographs from kids or from anybody. He didn't like to do that and was so often rude to fans. By 1998, World Championship Wrestling was running into full gear and signing many famous faces from WWE's past and present roster. 
when Hulk Hogan's NWO needed a new faction to feud with, and that faction needed a recognisable name to front it. The Ultimate Warrior was given the call. However, the character seemingly still belonged to WWF and Titan Sports, who defended their ownership of the copyright. When I got back to work in WCW in 1998, the reason I went back as Warrior was because as soon as WWF got wind of the fact that I'd been approached by WCW to go to work there, they filed a motion to stop it, saying that I didn't own the rights to the character to be able to do that. The lawsuit didn't start as a thing about who owns the rights to anything or me changing my name to Warrior so I can continue to be a wrestler. That's all just silly stuff. That's just all urban legends that have been out for years. It started as a breach of contract. So they filed a motion to say that I couldn't do that and what I did was I went and proved because of my performances in the business as Dingo Warrior that I did own those and the judge agreed that I did. The look, the style, the initial beginnings of Warrior, of Ultimate Warrior as he eventually became, certainly started with Dingo Warrior. Vince had Pat Patterson and Bruce Pritchard file false affidavits saying that they came up with the Ultimate, which is another one of those urban legends that isn't true. They didn't. I came up with it. My first promo I did, my first television appearance in Green Bay, Wisconsin, down in a little studio room when I was cutting a promo about what I was. I said, I'm not this kind of warrior. I'm not that kind of warrior. I am the ultimate warrior. That's why today I have ultimate too, because it all came out of the settlement of the trial, of the litigation. Famously appearing as a figment of Hulk Hogan's imagination in a wacky segment featuring a two-way mirror, the feud culminated in a match between the two at the Halloween Havoc pay-per-view event in 1998 which was widely regarded as a disappointment due to Warrior's apparent lack of in-ring conditioning and the confusing storyline. His poor reception led Warrior to take his frustrations out on those backstage, never managing to find friends in the locker room. Warrior was weird. I didn't share a lot of conversations with him, but I remember when he came into WCW, he was referring to himself in third person around the boys. He was calling himself Warrior. He's talking about himself to the boys in conversation. Following the Halloween Havoc match, the Ultimate Warrior continued to make sporadic appearances in WCW, but never regained the momentum or popularity that he had enjoyed in his prime with WWF. He was often criticised for his limited in-ring ability and his inability to adapt to the changing style of professional wrestling in the late 90s. Almost all the wrestlers who knew the Warrior during this period struggled to find much pleasant to say about his attitude or work ethic. Warrior has since gone on to say that he feels he was only ever contracted to WCW in order for Hulk Hogan to get his win back as retribution for Warrior's success at WrestleMania. In 2000, the Ultimate Warrior was released from his WCW contract and although he would make a handful of appearances over the next 14 years for smaller wrestling shows, this effectively ended his career as a professional wrestler. Warrior's time in the public spotlight, however, had only just begun. 2005 and 2006 were years filled with numerous legal battles for Warrior and his business. The years saw him in court to defend his honour over the WWF documentary The Self-Destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, which was inflammatory and a little biased to say the least. Then, the gaming creators THQ caught a legal dispute from the Warrior over his likeness in their video games. All of which must surely have drained the very life out of the Warrior and further soured his opinion on the wrestling industry and its related operators. However, the Warrior wasn't always the one making the accusations when he made a deal to sell a wrestling memorabilia collector around $30,000 worth of his old gear and costumes, the trade went sour and almost ended up in court. Elias says he paid Warrior nearly $30,000 for the gear and the autographs, but claims the wrestler went MIA and never sent Elias any of the promised merchandise. Warrior's team responded, Earlier this week, Mr. Christopher Elias used TMZ and the Santa Fe County Sheriff Department in an apparent effort to gain himself publicity at the expense of professional wrestling legend The Ultimate Warrior. The matter that has arisen between Warrior and Mr. Elias is in relation to a simple contractual dispute. The facts of which will speak for themselves. Mr. Elias's allegations of criminal fraud are completely unfounded, ill-advised and unfortunate. This is a purely civil matter that is in the process of being resolved by our attorney. 
52 fucking years I've been on this fucking planet. Fuck! 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 But before I go, I wanted to let someone out there know that I found something. Hey, Terry, I found that bullet, man. You know that bullet you were talking about on that sit-down interview when you said Ultimate Warrior was given a bullet to kill Hulkamania? I found it. Throughout his wrestling career, the Warrior had been known to be outspoken behind the scenes about his personal beliefs on same-sex marriage and all that surrounds those issues. In some occasions allowing his personal beliefs to seep into interviews when he was meant to be portraying a character. In one such occasion, he made several homophobic remarks in a 1991 interview where he spoke of homosexuality as detestable and not normal. Another incident occurred in 1996 when Warrior was invited to give a speech at the University of Connecticut and spoke on his beliefs once again, most famously stating that queering doesn't make the world work. That homosexuals? Oh, Homosexuality? You don't have an orgasm on me, honey. <laughs> In another bizarre outburst, Warrior responded to a wrestling fan's request for an autograph by calling him queer and refusing to sign it for him because of the way he looked. Idiots like you. And they look at you. What have you done? Take your shirt off. Show us what you are. These comments were met with widespread condemnation and backlash, both from fans and from the wrestling industry. That, that queers are as legitimate as heterosexuals? How are they not? That the anarchists, because queering doesn't make the world work. <laughs> when asked to be a part of a WWE talk panel show via email, the warrior was offended by the proposed hosts, stating, Of course not. I do not accept this brainless, disgraceful invitation. I do not. You can rescue yourself, Vince. Do your own damage control. I've no ear for your begging anymore. Only if you were on fire would I help you. It'd just be too hard to resist pissing on you. Order the queer and the cripple who host the show to read what I have written here and here. And while they do that, have them hold up mirrors looking at themselves so they can know exactly the kind of people in your organisation I'm writing about. No apologies, I don't discriminate for the handicapped who sign on to behave degenerately. When visiting a local cinema, he later wrote in his review of the experience, One guy without his husband and two physically repulsive butch dykes slurping on one another's tongues, really on the front row, had a real hard time cozying up to my principled heterosexual obstinacy. So, in an act of pure selfish pleasure, the guy got himself physically thrown out by the masculine security guard, unmistakably loving every single masochistic, manhandled moment of it. And the dykes, well, they ran out screaming and yelling like speared wild boars that I was a homophobe for making my remarks. In addition to this incident, there are several other instances where the Ultimate Warrior expressed homophobic views. In his book One Warrior Nation, he wrote about his beliefs that homosexuality was a destructive and selfish lifestyle, and he frequently used homophobic slurs in his interviews and public appearances. The Ultimate Warrior later apologised for these remarks, but his comments had already done significant damage to his reputation and to the LGBTQ community. You know, I was in my mid-30s. I wasn't just going to sit or retire and just not do anything. So uh, I started with a real simple idea uh, of just going out talking to young people, all different ages. And I don't pull my punches about anything. Joining us now with an inside look at what really goes on behind the scenes at the WWE Wrestling, we have legend Warrior with us. Hey, Warrior, how are you? I'm uh, doing super, Sean. How are you doing? We're good. All right. Well, you know, I was we, beginning to think that you were intimidated by my pure form of conservatism. As Warrior's polarizing views drove him further away from the more PG attitude in pro wrestling at the time, so he made his move further to the right and became a conservative public speaker. Perhaps in an attempt to garner attention online, and perhaps because of the real hatred in Warrior's heart, the longer he continued to speak, 
the angrier, more twisted, and more filled with spite his rhetoric became, seemingly going after the disenfranchised and minorities with the focus of his disdain. He lashed out at black rights advocate Martin Luther King in a video diary on YouTube, stating, Martin marched a few times from Selma to Montgomery. It's only about 40 miles, and he walked along paved roads with security escorts and modern comforts and conveniences. He wrote a few jailhouse letters, plagiarised a great many speeches, and played up his last name King as if he was one. He led his best rally amid the monuments of Washington, D.C. He preached proper righteous behaviour while he at the same time committed adultery many publicly verifiable times. The woman who had become my wife walked into my life. She was conservative and through her I realised I had been, without knowing directly, all along living by a conservative philosophy of life. He continued his attack on minorities in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, where he spoke negatively on the survivors, saying, Anyone who expresses sentiments like, how could they let this hurricane come here and do this to our lives, is a kook as far as I'm concerned. Those that somehow believe people are directly to blame for the happening of a natural catastrophe don't deserve to be heard. In fact, they should be told to shut the hell up. These kind of people contribute nothing towards repairing things to a better state. Truth is, these people thrive on despair and disarray, chaos, mentally and physically, and in the way they conduct their lives is nothing new to them. They forgot their whole lives in and around it. The hurricane to them was nothing more like rearranging the furniture. If we could be shown what general conditions they lived in before the hurricane, we would see that they had little respect for what they did have. We would see just how unorganised, unclean and dysfunctionally they lived. They never gave a care for order, cleanliness or function before, but now that they can get someone's attention who will possibly take over the responsibility of their life for them, they go on these tirades about how their life has been ruined. Their lives were already in ruin, self-ruin, ruined by the bad choices they made over and over, beginning with the choice to sit on their ass, expecting someone else to hand them a wonderful, beautiful, healthy and wealthy life. And excuse me for being the one to say so, but if you have a dozen kids and no husband to be a father, there are some holes in your life plan that should be sewed up. He also made racist remarks using racial slurs to describe African American wrestlers. In a statement, WWE denounced the Ultimate Warrior's comments as abhorrent and unacceptable. Perhaps the Warrior could sense his own impending doom. Perhaps he just had no more hate left to give, but over the next two years he wiped away the face paint and a semblance of the original Jim Helwig shined through. Partly spurned on by his relationship with his wife and two young daughters, Warrior attempted to make amends for his wrongdoings in the past and reconciled with many whom he had caused pain on his journey. He even managed to mend the bridge which led the way back to WWE with Triple H, now a high-ranking member of the decision-making team, putting aside his own feelings about their squash match at WrestleMania, bringing Warrior and Vince McMahon together one last time and inducting him into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2014. Perhaps fitting for a man who saw himself as part pro wrestler and part comic book hero then, that only a few days later, after finally making amends, the Ultimate Warrior died but not before giving one of the most heartfelt and memorable last speeches of all time. During his acceptance speech for the Hall of Fame, Warrior spoke of how he believed there should be a new Jimmy Miranda Award created in the honour of backstage staff, although this never came to be, with the help of Warrior's wife Dana, an award and statue was created to honour those who have faced adversity and fought through it. And let me just state that I believe it is both heartwarming and a decent thing for WWE to do in order to shed light on some certain struggles and those like them, as well as share some of the media attention with several charities who aim to change the world for the better. However, with everything we now know about the Ultimate Warrior and the man under all of that hair, doesn't naming an award after him seem problematic? You disagree? Okay. Perhaps you're a die-hard Ultimate Warrior fan, that's fine. Or perhaps you think that the name of the award is irrelevant compared to those who it's designed to help. Again, okay. But just to make things worse, the announcement for the Hashtag Unleash Your Warrior campaign 
an initiative to support those suffering from breast cancer just so happened to coincide with the death of legendary wrestling figure Bobby the Brain Heenan. Why is his death so significant to WWE's latest award? Well, it meant that comments made by the Ultimate Warrior about Heenan were circling the web and overshadowing WWE's big announcement. As for you, Bobby Heenan, it's just too difficult to keep a straight face, talking about the pure two-faced bag of shit you are and have always been. What with you also actually wearing one as a piece of body jewellery, you are a dying, diseased on the inside and no more time left to get back any of the integrity that matters the most on death's bed. Sadly, Bobby Heenan died of cancer, which makes Warrior's next comments all the more terrible. Imagine what it will be like lying there taking in your last breaths, knowing you hoard yourself out your whole life and had to in your final years, be faced with emptying your own personal shit bag, affirming to you the true value of what you achieve in your life. Not even Vince could come up with a better finish than this. Karma is just a beautiful thing to behold. WWE attempted to fight the backlash for the award's new name, stating, WWE's Unleash Your Warrior Breast Cancer Awareness Campaign and Annual Warrior Award recognise individuals that exhibit the strength and courage of WWE's legendary character, the Ultimate Warrior. Any attempt to distract from the mission of these initiatives and take the spotlight away from the honorees is unfortunately misguided. So he was inducted into the Hall of Fame on Saturday, then celebrated the next night at WrestleMania on the Sunday, before appearing in a WWE ring for the first time in 18 years on the Monday. It was on this edition of Raw that the Ultimate Warrior spoke to the fans and said, Every man's heart one day beats its final beat, his lungs breathe their final breath, and if what that man did in his life makes the blood pulse through the body of others and makes them bleed deeper than something that is larger than life, then his essence, his spirit will be immortalised by the storytellers by the loyalty of those who honour him and make what that man did live forever. And that's the truest and most understandable statement he ever uttered within a WWE ring. Perhaps it shows that through it all, Warrior was simply trying to live his life in order to entertain fans with captivating and memorable stories in the best way he knew how, which was his incredibly hard-earned physique. It was really surreal because he made it to Raw on Monday and then the next day he died. So a very set of surreal circumstances surrounding the last time I was around the Ultimate Warrior. The WWE announcing overnight that James and Brian Helwig, who was better known, you see him there as the Ultimate Warrior has died at the age of 54. The very next night it happened. He passed away on April the 8th, 2014 due to a heart attack in Scottsdale, Arizona. The WWE honoured his memory with a 10 bell salute and a video tribute on the April 14th episode of Raw. Warrior's death was mourned by many wrestling fans around the world. However, his controversial legacy continues to be debated by those who remember his impact on the wrestling industry. James Bryan Helwig and also the Ultimate Warrior had a controversial life both in and out of the wrestling ring. He was undoubtedly one of the most recognisable faces of the late 1980s and early 1990s as a charismatic and energetic wrestler in the WWF. Some critics argue that Helwig's problematic behaviour has tarnished his legacy and that his controversies overshadowed his achievements in the wrestling ring. While he was undeniably successful as the Ultimate Warrior, his controversial legacy remains a point of debate amongst wrestling fans and critics alike. Despite the controversy, Helwig's impact on the world of professional wrestling cannot be ignored. He inspired a generation of fans and wrestlers alike with his unique style and larger-than-life personality. He also helped to popularise professional wrestling in the mainstream, paving the way for future generations of wrestlers. Jim Helwig's life was a complex and controversial one. While he achieved great success in the wrestling world as the Ultimate Warrior, his problematic behaviour and controversial views have led to a mixed legacy. His impact on the world of professional wrestling remains the subject of debate, but there is no denying that he left a lasting impression on all of us.